Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa ala. Allahumma a'alibna ma yinfa'na wa yinfa'na bima a'alimtana wa zidna wa nifma. Who could say that in English? Wa Allah, teach us that which of benefit to us and help us to benefit from that which we have learned. A great dua Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he used to say, Allahumma ni a'udhu bika ma ilmu la yinfa'a. I seek refuge in you, Allah, from knowledge that does not benefit. Sometimes we learn many things that don't benefit us. Today we'll continue talking about the life of the greatest man ever walked on earth, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Based on the discussion we had, we'll shift a bit into looking at the history of da'wah. And the approach for the approaches that Prophet Muhammad followed in dealing with the ups and downs that he went through along with his companions in spreading the word of Allah. Strategies that he used in dealing with the troubles, the hurdles, the challenges that faced Dao at his time. And we may benefit from that in our times as well. لقد كان لكم في رسول الله هذا بس تجنبه من الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم. so it came to mind a situation and that may take us into a number of episodes talking about this issue. it came to mind when the prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was sitting along with his companions at دار الأرقم ابن الأرقم. Among the people with him, you know Darul Arqam and Arqam? This is a small house, belonged to a person, his name is Al Arqam ibn Al Arqam, one of the companions of Prophet Muhammad <laughs> which considered to be a bit far away from Mecca. It's not you know, far away from the, the gatherings of people, because people in Mecca they were around the Haram, and the well of Zamzam was there, see? And we talk about the Mas'a, you see, Marwa, Safa al Marwa, it is close to Safa. You see, it was a bit far from Mecca at that time. If you look at Mecca now, you don't, you don't believe it. Okay? So the Prophet used to go along with his companions to meet them. Okay? And he had to establish a center. A center of knowledge, a center of da'wah, a center of gathering. The Qurayshis were having another center, which was called Dar al Now we have Dar you see, he was establishing what we call established work of Dao. It has to be established. You have a center. You have a place. When somebody needs you, they could really go and find you, looking for any address, and they go to you. So this is the place where in, it was a secret hideout for the Prophet Only the very close companions of Prophet Muhammad knew about it. So, when they wanted to find Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, away from the eyes of the enemies of Islam, the Qurayshis, they would go to Dar al So, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in that room, along with some of his companions. Can you name some of them? He might be there. Probably Umar was not a Muslim by that time. Ali. 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 Ali was there. Well, he mentioned them. But there were two that, I, for sure, we know that were at that time, this incident, where Zayd ibn Haritha was there, and some others. You know, Zayd ibn Haritha. You know, the, stu- the story of Zayd. Okay, this is the person even the Prophet adapted until the ayah of of negating adaption to this place. So the Prophet ﷺ was sitting with his companions. We know the Zayd because the story is related to Zayd. So we know that the Prophet ﷺ was having a place to seek refuge away from the eyes of the enemies so they could get together, plan their work of Tao, plan their work of guidance, find a shelter for people because you cannot meet in public. Okay, even the Prophet was faced difficulty praying in the Haram next to the Kaaba. Many of his companions wouldn't dare to do that. Okay, wouldn't dare to do that. 
uh, we'll talk about one of them there when he became Muslim. He was a young man, very enthusiastic, said, why? I will go. And he recited the Quran in public. He was beaten twice, okay, until the companions carried him who was almost dead. Okay. Yeah. But so this just to feed the context in which Bilal at that time was persecuted. Hubayt was persecuted. The Prophet himself was persecuted. Okay. But at different levels. Different levels. So at that time the Prophet said to his companions said, Who would like to marry a woman from paradise? If this question has come to you, say, how does she look? <laughs> how old is she? How much money she has? <laughs> <laughs> what is her height? <laughs> what is her weight? Yeah. And you talk about this thing before you decide. <laughs> Even if she is, do you want to marry an ugly woman in paradise? <laughs> you see? So, anyway, Zayd said yes. And Zayd, Zayd was among the youngest. I will pursue her. You know who that woman was? I just, because this question that was raised by one of our brothers last time, for what purpose the companions marry? And the Prophet himself married. This is related even to da'wah. Because these social relationships are intertwined together. You know, you cannot take da'wah away from your life. Just like a priest giving, and his life is something different. We don't accept that in Islam. Your life is part of da'wah. Your business is part of Dao. Your education is part of Dao. Dao. Your politics is part of Dao. I mean, this is the deen, complete deen. It's, you cannot behave differently. You cannot be, you see, a different person. When you go to church, you, you act in a different way. And when you're out of church, you're a different person. No. So Zayd said, I, I, Rasulullah, I will do it. You know who that woman was? The, the wife of, of Zayd? Zayd. Zayd ibn Haris. The, the discussion of Prophet Muhammad Zainab. This is, came later on. Oh. No, that is a Qurayshi. No, this is mm -hmm. an old woman, black woman, an ex-slave woman. She was a slave. Barira? No. Um Umm Aina. She, she is, has already married, many years older than Zayd. <laughs> She had already had a son, and she was divorced because Ayman is her. Is her okay, and Zayd said, "I." When she came on, he was very happy, and he married her. She gave birth to to who? To Usama. Usama bin Zayd. How come, brothers? What what's wrong with you today? What did you eat full? <laughs> okay, Usama bin Zayd. Osama was black, you know that? And Zayd was white. Even the Munafiqeen, my brother talked about the Munafiqeen, they started saying, how oh, come? A white father and a black son. <laughs> Those people were color, color blind. You see, they wanted paradise. You see, this is very important to look at. This is how the hour started with those people. Humble, committed, sincere, truthful. They negate many things in this life. Overlook them. He wanted to marry a woman of the people of paradise. And look at the, that woman who is from the people of paradise. It's not the most beautiful woman of Quraysh. It's not the wealthiest woman of Quraysh. It is the poorest, the most neglected. A widow, I mean a, a divorced woman. Having her own children, and I talk about a young man, a handsome young man. His name was Zayd ibn Muhammad. No, yeah, yeah, that time, yeah. that time, before you know, adoption was abrogated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you see, and he's anybody of Quraysh considered him to be the son of Prophet Muhammad. He wanted to. He cannot marry any of the the, the daughters of Prophet Muhammad because he is their son. brother, brother to the daughters of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi And I wanted to imagine the situation so you really appreciate what's going on and how those people were really sacrificing for the sake of Allah, for the sake of the spread of this deen. And I wanted to know how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi loved Prophet Zayd. 
in Medina, many years back, both of them were sleeping, Osama and his father, Zayd. And they were covered. Only their feet that you could see. Uh, uh, an Arab, and some of the Arabs were very good at tracing ancestors, ancestry. Okay? They look at you and say, you are the son of this man. This is, must be your brother. Okay? They look at your fingers, see these things. I mean, they, they are, some of them are still until now. So, he came for the first time to know, to know about Islam. He was astonished. He said, oh! He said, why? What's going on? He said, this is from this. But this is black and this is white. white. <laughs> Look what the Prophet said. He gathered the companions. He said, come, come, come. Stop. What did you say before you came? He said, this. They want him to be a witness because people started gossiping. You see how the Prophet loved his companions? Caring about the people who work with you in Dawah is very important. And this is why the Prophet cared so much. He didn't forget what they said. It's at the back of his mind. But when the right moment came, he didn't hesitate to bring it up. And the Prophet used to love Zayd and Usama so much. They called him al hibbu Ibn al hib the most beloved one of the son of the most beloved one. To who? To the Prophet Muhammad. Do you think Prophet Muhammad loves somebody that Allah does not love? No. You see? But this will tell you how those people were living. The reality of the da'wah, of da'wah at that time. Many of the companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu were persecuted. And he never, Bilal would come to him with burns, with bruises, with blood coming out of his nose, maybe with a broken teeth, with a very red, red eye, buffed eye. He didn't say, take a dagger and go and kill Umayyah ibn Khalaf. He said, you must be this is the problem, Yaqwan. Sometimes you go and learn something about Islam, you go to your village in, uh, in Ghana, or, and you learn something, you say, Oh, you do this? This is wrong. You are kuffar. Mm -hmm. uh, let's fight against them. No. Da'wah has to go through the approach of Prophet Muhammad. No. No. He started da'wah with patience. And this is why Allah said to him, Wasbir nafsak. Not only become, become very patient with who? Who is the best of course for Allah? Who is the best da'ya ever walked in here? Who? Who my brother? The greatest da'ya? Our brother. See, and Allah said to him to be patient with those who give da'a for the sake of Allah. And now we talk about everybody, see? Imagine that you are going in the same path of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu the same path of all prophets before Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the people. In another situation, Khubayb would come to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he would say about himself, "They used to beat me until I lose consciousness, and he used to work as blacksmith, and they would take." The charcoal that is really burning. You put what do you put in charcoal? Steel. As a black steel. Steel. So you could really. They will put who? They will throw it in the ground, and they will take away and drag him on the charcoal. Subhanallah. And he said, until the charcoal is extinguished by the skin. Yeah, I just wanted to know the situation. SubhanAllah, we enjoy that, we enjoy Islam. Well, we don't realize how it went through. How it went through. And he would come to Prophet Muhammad and say, I cannot do anything for you. I cannot do anything for you. You've got to be patient. Sumayya, Ammar ibn Yasir, Yasir, Ibn Abu Jahl, killed Sumayya. She was the first martyr in Islam. The first martyr of Islam is a woman. Is a black woman. Is a slave. Who gave herself for the sake of Allah. 
Those are the real people who built Islam from the beginning. Along with Prophet Muhammad <laughs> gave their lives. What did the Prophet Sallallahu say? He cried, he wept, he was very sad. But he said, Sabran ala yasir, fa inna mu'idakum al jannah. Be patient. Even his father, Yasir, was killed. Okay? Be patient, the family of Yasir. Our destination is? Paradise. Our appointment is? Paradise. Paradise. So his promise for them, nothing in this life, but paradise, patience. The Prophet ﷺ used to see something that all people, because they trusted him so much, they gave their lives for the sake of Allah. Imagine such a situation, the challenges that they faced, their lives at stake. At any moment they could lose their lives, families, everything. And they were very patient. Allahumma sabbirna ya Allah. Allahumma thabbitna. Allahumma salakhwana fi suriya. Allahumma thabbitna. Allahumma bakara khluna. Allahumma khutum fi dhalameen wa fi nisa. Allahumma kulluhum awna wa ma azida wa nasu. Ya akhwan, this continues. This cycle. Now those people fight for what? To get money? To get food? To be in their houses? No. They refused to prostrate to anything but anybody but Allah. Nobody is greater than Allah. You see? If Allah will be with them. They are suffering and may Allah make it easy for them. So I just want you to know how the da'wah was taking place in the time of Prophet Muhammad. We'll stop here and continue inshallah with another episode. We'll look at another aspect of da'wah at the life of Prophet Muhammad at the beginning of this deen that we get it complete, perfect. And you find somebody who would like to to zigzag and play with it. No, we don't accept that. We only accept what Prophet Muhammad <laughs> sacrificed for, his companions sacrificed for, and worked for. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.